Father, I just thank you for this time together, Lord God. And my prayer, Lord, is that you don't let any word come out of my mouth that you've not put in my heart. In Jesus' name. Uh, a number of years ago, you know, we've been coming over to the UK for, for many years. And I don't know how long ago it was, but sometime, some time ago. You know, I, his promise is he will lead us in paths of righteousness for, our name, for his namesake. Not for our name's sake. And I am trying to learn day by day, and I've been doing this for a long time, how to follow. And one of the ways is when oftentimes we come to the UK, I have no idea where I am or where I'm going. But God will appoint somebody or bring somebody who will direct us. I mean, just they say, come on, we've got to go here, and they'll put me in a car and drive off. I have no idea where I am. Or I mean, Seriously, I mean, that's just the way it's been. It's been a blessing. So I can remember that we were here one year, and Joe Belieby was taking Alice and I around all over the place. I never quite knew where we were, but we were doing house groups. We'd, we'd go someplace, and there would be a house group, and I'd speak to them, and I, he'd take me to another place, and we'd do, and this was going on and on and on. And we weren't having the opportunity to go back to them. It was just, you know, we'd go there and get to speak to them for two, three hours. And, and it became a concern of mine that in a scenario like that, in a setting like that, where you only get to see people one time and only get to share with them a little bit, I went and I prayed and I said, Lord, what can I say in that, that period of time? What do you want me to say? that is the important message. You know, if they're only going to hear it one time. And that still small voice that I do know so well said to me, all of it. What should I teach? All of it. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And by the way, throw in the entire history of man while you're at it. Now, yeah. Now I have to tell you something. And people that know me well can tell you, as a rule, I could probably talk a lot about Jesus a lot longer than you could listen to me talk about Jesus. But I didn't have that time. I mean, you know, it's just, okay, here you go. So, in his graciousness, because he never calls you to do something that he doesn't equip you to do, he gave me the message. The entire Bible, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and the entire history of man. So I want to share that with you. And it won't take more than 10, 15 hours or 20 hours. <laughs> if, you're going to, if you're going to teach the whole thing, and I said I'm going to do it from, from the beginning to end, the logical place to start is in the beginning. And fortunately, that's the way God spoke it, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know this is all Genesis chapter 1, right? Do you realize that the whole purpose of this was all of his creation was to create a place to be inhabited by man. Because his purpose was man. I thank God for putty, puppy dogs and kitty cats and all of the animals he's given us to be companions. I thank God for the angels he sends to give us messages and so forth. But God's focus is on mankind. So he sent us to be, you know, he created the entire earth to be inhabited by man. So that's the starting point. Now, he goes on, you know, and I, I'm, I'm going to say a lot of things I know you're aware of. Uh, he said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees on earth bearing, fruit after their own kind, right? That's a phrase that appears over and over, after their own kind. Right, you're all, you're all familiar with that, right? So then, in the fullness of time here, it says... God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We were, man was made in the likeness of God. And in verse 27 in that first chapter, he says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Man was made in the image of God. He was formed. He took Adam and formed him out of the dust of the earth. You know how the story goes. 
The serpent came in, questioned the Word of God, and Eve believed the lie. You ever stop and think? God had given mankind, man that was male and female. He gave them, he gave them dominion over the earth when he placed them in the earth. Serpent came along and said to Eve, the woman, she wasn't even called Eve then, she, hadn't have it, she didn't have an identity apart from her husband. And the serpent said, did God really say? You know what happened. Did you ever think what could have happened? The woman could have said that serpent right then and there. Yes, he did. Now get out of here. It would have been that simple. But she didn't. She bought into the lie and then passed it along to her husband and he took from the fruit and ate, right? Now you've heard, I'm sure, you've heard somebody say, you may even said it yourself, all, we're all made in the image of God. That's not true. That's not true. Adam was made in the image of God. God drew the woman out of her. She came out of him in, in his likeness looked like was in the image of God. They sinned. They chose to sin. Think about this and tell me if I'm wrong. Sin is a deformity. Yes. I mean, have you ever seen crippled people walk around I mean, with deformed bodies? There's no deformity greater than sin that mars the perfection of God's creation. So man went from being formed to being deformed. That's the simple truth. So what happened? I'll tell you what happened since you asked. <laughs> so what happened was, because of the sin, it says in chapter 3, he drove man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned away every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. The center of, of the garden is the tree of life. And now, God has kicked Adam and the woman out of the garden and away from the tree of life. Remember that. That may come up again or it may come up in the test you have. Did I not tell you there was going to be a test? Okay, I'm sorry. So man went from being formed to being deformed, and then he was ejected from the garden and pushed away from the tree of life. But it doesn't end there, as you might believe. <clears throat> Satan is not creative. God is creative. Satan can't create a lie. He can only corrupt the truth. He wants to, he's, he's, not, he's not even smart. I mean, any time you see somebody rebel against God and you think that, that's smart, okay? They don't come more unsmart than Satan. So he only has one plan. So he had a message, and gosh, when he, when he preached that message, mankind bought into it. You can make yourself like God. Well, the problem is, over the ages, it became his plan to keep that message going. So it says, I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah chapter 14. 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Now there's a reason for that. Everything happens with purpose. Satan wanted you to stay misinformed. He wanted to keep you from the truth. By the way, I just I was thinking about something. If you have a question, because a lot of people have challenged, well, everybody's made in the image of God. Let me just turn for a second to Genesis chapter 5. And you, if you're following along in your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 5, or you cannot, whatever you choose to do. In Genesis 5, 3, verse 3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. According to its own kind. That, was, that is the plan of God. So Adam, he was deformed by sin, 
and he passed that along. From generation to generation, it gets passed along. Is that not true? The sins of the father are passed on from generation to generation. That deformity is passed along. So, God is working this way. The devil's at work. Well, I'm going to show you who wins at the end here. Okay. So man went from being formed to deformed to misinformed. You with me so far? Okay. Not a problem. It's easy. This is, you know, it's amazing the simplicity of God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, I'm concerned. Lest the serpent who deceived you come along and remove from you the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Be beware of complexity with the Lord. Because religion tends to make things complex when God tends to make things simple. And these are simple truths, all right? So moving right along. God had a plan. The plan was for man, and plan was for a bride for his son, a bride without spot or wrinkle. So in spite of what had happened, God can heal what happened. So it starts with prayer. Do you, know, do you ever notice that how, much, how many things start with prayer? Can you turn the mic up? They can't hear me. Uh, okay. okay. In John, amen. In John 17, Jesus went into the garden, right? And he prayed. You know what he, you, he prayed? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it and I'm going to tell you. Jesus Christ prayed to the Father that they, speaking of us, may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. And then he went on to say, he prayed that we'd be perfected in unity, but that we would be one. That prayer has power. The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You have to understand how things happen because of prayer, even if it's the prayer of Jesus, or should I say, especially if it's the prayer of Jesus. So Jesus Christ went to the cross on our behalf. He took our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for our sake. And he died on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. Had it not been for that one simple prayer, none of us would be sitting here tonight. We'd most likely be out at some pub or at a football game. Or that, Isn't that the truth? The only reason we're gathered here is because Jesus Christ prayed a prayer in the will of the Father that he would forgive our sins. So you know what happened? Mankind, in an instant, when Jesus said it is finished, mankind was reformed. You know, a lot of people talk about reformation, ref, reformation movements and everything. No, no, no. Reformation, this is reformation. When God brought us back to that state where we could be the children of God. So mankind went from being formed to deformed to misinformed, to being reformed. And not one of them said hallelujah. I can't help that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I can get excited about that, but that's, that's neither here nor there. <sighs> but that's not enough. That's not enough. You've been reformed. I was talking to Morris earlier this morning. I said, you know, how many of you here know of the empty tomb? Uh, I, you might not, because it wasn't empty. The empty tomb was never empty. Do you not know the account of when the apostles rushed there, and they got to the tomb, and the stone had been rolled away? Oh, Jesus wasn't there. But the grave clothes that he had been buried in were left behind. If something's there, if there's something in it, it's not empty. But then... In the account of Lazarus, because Lazarus is more like us. Just a man died, and Jesus called him by name. You know, 
Uh, there's probably an error in your Bible. I'll watch what I'm saying now here. It's very likely that your Bible says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Go back in there and change that. Instead of saying, Lazarus, comma, come forth, make it say, Lazarus, full stop. Because the moment he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, pop, came to life. We came to life. You came to life. I came to life because he called us by name. But there he was in the grave. So Jesus said, come forth. Once, once God has come to life in your body, you have to take action. There's action to be taken. He had to come out of that grave. But the difference is, if you looked in his grave, it was empty. Because he wore the grave clothes out. He came out of that tomb still wrapped in the garments of death. He came out of that tomb wrapped with his old traditions, with the old habits, with the old ways of thinking, just like we did. And the first thing Jesus said was, unbind him. We need to be unbound. And how were we unbound? Paul said it so simply. We, you, I, need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We need to get rid of that old way of thinking, that old life way th thinking, and come into the thinking of the new life. Okay? So mankind went from being formed, to being deformed, to being misinformed, to being reformed, and now to being transformed. That's the way it works. Otherwise, you might as well still be sitting in there. If you are not transformed by the renewing of your mind, you might as well still be sitting in the grave. Nothing good is going to happen in your life. I, I mean, you know what? When the world ends or when Jesus comes back, you may go to heaven, but you would ha you have missed totally that joy-filled, abundant life that he has for us here on this planet. And we would have missed the opportunity to be a witness for him, the power of his love. You've got to be transformed. That's not the end. That's not the end. Because I was going to say you should look at each other, but I'm not going to say that because that would be rude. Look at me. Do you honestly think that I am the image of the living almighty God? Now I'm going to tell you something. I look more like him today than I did yesterday. Because he's at work in my life. This has nothing to do with anything, but as we film this, tomorrow is my birthday. I, well, I don't know. No. <laughs> I say that because I'm going to be 75 years old tomorrow. I am becoming more and more like the Ancient of Days every day. So he's changing me. That's his work. It's not me. I'm just submitted to him. He's the potter on the clay. He's molding me and shaping. What? Well, let me see. You want to mark great promises in the Bible? I'll give you the greatest, I think, is the greatest promise that there is in the Bible for us. Us who have been called by the Lord. For whom he foreknew, he predestined or predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. We're going to look like him again. We are going to look like him again. It hasn't happened yet. We still see, there's, there's still some of us showing. That's a fact. But we're coming to a time when there'll be none of us. What you will see is Jesus Christ. Because God's plan, since he, he, has a, he does, He has a plan, a plan for life, that we go from, from being formed, hallelujah, and then being deformed. And then through all the ages being misinformed. i got to tell you something. I got saved on my 33rd birthday, 42 years ago. Up until that time, I had been misinformed. I belonged to a church. I would have told you that. Well, I wouldn't have even said I was a Christian. I would have told you what denomination I was. But I was li living a life misinformed about God and the things of God. So I went from being misinformed, and hallelujah, he came to seek and to find that which was lost. I was lost. But he found me, and I was reformed. And in all these years, that's what's been happening in my life. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. Not through yet, but the promise is there. I will be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. So I will have gone from, you, we, mankind, will have gone from being, come on, help me out here now, formed, 
to deform, to misinform, to reform, to transform, to conform back into the image of his son. Amen. I don't know what time we started, but I'm going to tell you, that's the whole history of man. That's it. That's all there is to it. That's the history of man. But I did say that it was all going, also going to give you the entire Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now, one of the things I have learned as God is transforming me is that I need to, like Jesus and like God, watch over my word to perform it. So that being said, I'm going to Revelation chapter 22. I wouldn't kid you. Revelation 22, reading verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Oh, wait a minute. There we are. Back to the tree of life. We were kicked away from, mankind was kicked away from the tree of life way back there in Genesis. And now here at the end of the Bible, we have the right, we who are obeying his commandments, we who are his children, come back to being at the tree of life. Because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. And it goes on to say, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Hallelujah. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. He formed the people to declare his praise. But that's not the purpose. We're called to do that. Listen, we were called out of darkness. And we're supposed to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Didn't Peter write that? But there's more. Because if you've been to Jerusalem or you know anything about the layout of Jerusalem, yes, you go through the gates into the temple grounds. And there we praise God because he is worthy of our praise. I don't care. No, I'm going to say, I don't care what's going on in your life. He is worthy of your praise. He is worthy of your praise regardless of your circumstance. So we need to learn to fulfill that obligation to be that people of praise. But that's not the end. Because the end, the desire of my heart is to be fully in the presence of God. And that comes when it says we come before him, we worship and bow down. We kneel before our maker, the Lord our God, our maker, and worship and bow down. You see, that's where the Holy of Holies is. You can look at the story of all of the, the churches. If you look at the seven churches of Revelation, at the end of the seven churches of Revelation, after looking at one of the worst churches there was, the church of Laodicea, what you see is the elders. And they are falling on their faces before God, casting their crowns before Him and worshiping Him. God has designed us to worship Him. And I will tell you, when we are worshiping God, we are in the fullness of his presence. And I'm not talking about a song. Somehow we have been deceived again. We have been misinformed to believe that it's all about a praise is a nice jumpy fast song and worship is a nice slow song. Both of those are wrong. Do you think praise is a song? I've got a wife back there. Everybody wave to Alice. I love Alice. Alice is the... Is, this isn't good English, but uh, not even good American. <laughs> Alice is the goodest wife I know. I listen. I, uh, <laughs> she is such a wonderful help me to me. She has been such a blessing. We've been married now. It'll be this month. It'll be 51 years we're married. She has been such a blessing to me. She's a good cook. She is. Now let me ask you a question. I didn't say this for the purpose. That's all true. Is that praise? They meant to say yes, but they're just they're they're intimidated by a camera. Okay. That's praise. It's not just a matter, it's a matter of just being a people who say, you know, we have a magnificent God. We have a God who is able. That is praise indeed. That is high praise indeed. There's nothing wrong with singing praise. But praise is just talking about the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. But worship is not. Worship is about total, complete surrender. I have been so touched to see 
that one event in history of mankind has been meant by God to be carried through all of, all of eternity, not just man's history, and that was a Passover. Now Christ is our Passover. And on the Passover, he was with his disciples. He broke bread and he poured out the cup, his blood, his body, and he gave thanks. He left that night going out, singing hymns, it says. Do you know what hymns he was singing? The Psalms, there are particular hymns that have been sung by the Jews almost through all time. It's called the Great Hallel, the praises. Jesus Christ went walking towards the cross, singing praises to his Father. He goes from thanksgiving to praise. But worship was on the cross. When he humbled himself, even unto death. We need to come to that place where the goal of our life is to be that people of worship that God has formed us to be. So, half an hour. That's the whole story of man. That's the Bible from beginning to end. So all I have left to say is, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He's made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. So if that's not long enough for you, if you want more, just call me or something, or write to me, because I can talk about Jesus for a lot of time. <laughs> but that's the history of mankind, and that's the plan of God. So long, goodbye, and good night. I love you. Oh, let the sun of God unfold you. Thank you.